Okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, this is so exciting. I, I'm, I can't tell you how glad I am to see all of you here. This is, uh, I've been here at CSIS now for uh, eight years, and I, I'll have to say I think this is probably the biggest event that I've had since, since being here. And I'd, I'd like to, I'll say a few minutes, in a few minutes why. It's, a, it's a, just a big development for us. And uh, I'm so glad that so many of you are here to help us be a, be a part of this and to help, help kick it off. Let me first, uh, I, 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 can't, I can't do this without first starting with a series of thank yous. So I've got a, so bear with me a little bit, but there are a lot of people that, that made this possible as we launched this new Center for Global Public Health. And first, I have to thank the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, especially for giving the foundation to make this possible. And I especially want to acknowledge Tachi Yamada, and Patty Stonecipher, Joe Sorrell, Todd Summers, and Owen Ryan for all of the work that they did with us over the last year and a half to make this possible. And Sally Canfield, thank you. We're going to be leaving this. We'll turn to you very quickly, and I would like you to say a few words, if you wouldn't mind. Uh, Rajiv Venkaya is the head of the Foundation for Global Health Delivery and, uh, of course, is going to be on the board, and we're very, very, very grateful to have this. I've got three of my own trustees who were crucial in making this possible. First, Bill Frist. I mean, Senator Bill Frist was the majority leader. Uh, he was the only said, Senator Bill Frist dot uh, comma MD. You know, I think it's, I don't know how many times we've had that in our history. And uh, a couple of times he had to practice as an MD on the floor of the Senate. But it, uh, he was f early on uh, a pioneer in working issues of, of HIV AIDS. And that's how we first got to work with Senator Frist. And Senator Frist was uh, instrumental in picking that up. He was the co-chair with John Kerry when we started seven years ago on the HIV AIDS work that the Gates Foundation made possible. And uh, through that, uh, I must confess, we then leaned on him very hard and he agreed to join our board. And, and that was also part of the credibility that it gave us to be able to compete for something like this. Uh, two other members of the board, Helene Gale, Helene, and many of you know Helene. She's an icon, you know, in, in public health. Uh, at the time I first met Helene, and I met her through Steve, she was, of course, down at CDC in Atlanta and really was a pioneer getting us involved with HIV AIDS issues, especially in Africa. And Helene then went out to the Gates Foundation and then now is, of course, the head of CARE. And uh, extremely, uh, she's doing just a fabulous job at CARE. And uh, she couldn't be here today, but she did ask Kathy Woolard to join us, and Kathy's here. And I, I'm so grateful that she can be here today. Uh, I also want to say Charlie Sanders, who was a, uh, Dr. Charlie Sanders, who was the head of uh, uh, Massachusetts General. Uh, 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 just a pioneer in, in health issues in America. Charlie's on the board. He's been pushing us all the time for doing more on, on uh, health issues, and so it's because of his work we've done that. Let me say some thank yous also to a few other very crucial instances. The Kaiser Family Foundation, especially to Jennifer Cates and to Drew Altman and Matt James, who have been consistently working. They've, they do some really remarkable things. It's in knowledge infrastructure for the rest of us in this in the uh, think tank world, and it's just really indispensable to have them. Uh, Jeff Sturcio and Merck and company have been just partners at every step, and we're so grateful, especially for the work that they help us do in Africa and health. Ed Scott, where's Ed's right here. Now, Ed, every time I meet Ed, he says, well, I'm not an expert. I'm just an average kind of a guy. But, you know, Ed is the founder of the Center for Global Development and the One Campaign. This is a guy who's taken his personal wealth and put it to great causes. And he does it with just as much energy and conviction as he did in, in being a very successful businessman. And we are all better for it. I'm very grateful, Ed, that you've been willing to help us on this. Mike Merson, who is not with us today, but was with us earlier during our board meeting. He's the head of the Duke Institute for Health, Global Health. And he's been a tremendous guide and aid to us all along the way. And then. Where's, where's Bob Mallet? Bob Mallet, my, my old buddy Bob. We were colleagues together. He was the, was the Deputy Secretary over at Commerce when I was over at DOD. We had the chance to work together then, and I'm so grateful he's willing to help us now. Of course, Bob is, is the president of the Pfizer Foundation and uh, also has agreed to be on this board. So, Bob, thank you. These are very important colleagues that have brought us down this road. Let me just say a word why this is, uh, I think, so important. I. Um, 
and why CSIS is involved in it, frankly. I mean, we're a, we started off life as a defense think tank during the Cold War. And you say, what in the world is a defense think tank doing on health policy? Well, I think uh, I'll tell you how we really got into this new dimension. And uh, several years ago, we launched an effort which we called our Smart Power Project because we were saying, you know, America's been spending a lot of its effort using military muscle these last years, and we've let atrophy, the full scope of that which has drawn such strength to this country internationally through the years. And uh, the world's become a little unhappy with us, to be honest. That there's an opportunity now. There's an opportunity. I noticed that when we had the, you know, the, the flooding in Aceh province after the tsunami, you remember how that changed people's perspectives about America? I mean, we went there in the old-fashioned way, just to help. And it completely changed how people now thought about us as a country again. But well, we're in a bit of a hole as a nation. And there's no better way to dig out of that hole than to become a leader on something that people want and something people need. And this is a case to take the lead internationally on, on public health issues. It is not only a great humanitarian gesture, it's also good foreign policy. And it's something that America ought to emphasize. Now, CSIS is involved in it. And the reason I think that our friends with the Gates Foundation reached out and worked with us is because we touch a different constituency every day. You know, they can, they can meet any day of the week with a health minister. Any day. They don't, and they certainly don't need a CSIS for that. But we have ties to the defense ministries and to the foreign ministries and the interior ministries because that's been more of our traditional constituency. And we honestly believe that this is a new indispensable part of how America ought to be working in the world. So it's a wonderful partnership and we now have this opportunity. So uh, it's a, a very exciting day for us uh, and, a, and a whole new trajectory for how we want to work, we CSIS, want to work and try to help mobilize constructive public debate in Washington. So thank you. Thank you all for coming. Uh, I, I'm, I'm going to turn to you. Uh, can, can you join me now and, and uh, just say a word on behalf of the Gates Foundation? Because I think it would be great. Thank you very much, Sally. Appreciate your being thank here. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, John, and thank you, Steve, for inviting me here today. On behalf of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, I am pleased that our organizations could join together to create this much needed focus on global health policy. The Gates Foundation Global Health Advocacy Strategy has several key objectives, one of which is to encourage more and better health aid from donor countries. What we hope comes out of the establishment of the center is a focus on the better aspects of U.S. health assistance by promoting its integration into the nation's broader foreign policy and national security goals. The foundation believes that this integration will result in increased efficiency of U.S. global health aid, increased utilization of its foreign policy muscle to achieve global health ends, and broader support for global health issues among foreign policy and security interests that otherwise see it as largely humanitarian. This strategy would am amount to the maturing of global health as a pillar of U.S. foreign policy rather than a political afterthought. In addition, we hope to realize a broader approach to global health than is currently being achieved through the important but narrow focus mostly on disease-specific approaches like PEPFAR, the President's Malaria Initiative, and most re recently negre neglected tropical diseases. We hope that the spotlight the new CSIS Center can shine on these matters will broaden the engagement on global public health issues by serving to help create a new U.S. global health strategy that leverages U.S. leadership in a much more coordinated fashion and encourages reform in global health governance. As you may know today, U.S. global funding flows through many different avenues controlled by many different agencies that are often out of sync and sometimes in competition with one another. Moreover, other instruments of U.S. government, political pressure from Washington or local missions, positions in various multilateral organizations, and military-to-military -military engagements are also otherwise aligned with the priorities represented by its funding flows. We believe that the new CSIS Center for Global Health Policy 
is an important effort to promote more coordination in this space, utilizing its special connections with the foreign policy, military, and intelligence communities, as well as its ability to convene otherwise combative political forces to identi identify and pursue common global health priorities. Thank you very much for having me today, and we look forward to our continued work in this area. Thank you, Sally, and thank you, John. I'm Steve Morris from CSIS. I wanted to say a few words about our mandate and what kind of activities are going to be coming forward in this next phase, and also comment a bit about some of the, some of the particular challenges that we're going to face. And then we will move to the, to the heart of the matter here, which is a roundtable discussion that Senator Frist will lead with many of our board members. We've put together the beginnings on our website of materials about how the center will function. Let me just quickly review for you what we'll be doing. Our mandate, as we've negotiated this with our friends over the last year, our mandate boils down to striving to generate a long-term strategic U.S. vision for global health. And secondly, uh, taking systematic steps to enlarge the pool of new champions of global health, drawn from foreign policy, international security, media and business leadership ranks. Our third element is to try and leverage CSIS's special expertise by putting a spotlight on the security dimensions of global health. We're charged also with trying to create new means to communicate to senior policymakers technological and behavioral discoveries that are emerging in different places, scattered about, but which it's hard to have a clear grasp of exactly what's coming forward and what to make of it as a policymaker. And lastly, to strengthen the links through CSIS with health policy talent outside our borders and identify key entry points for concerted effort to strengthen the governance of global health. We'll be undertaking a number of key activities in this next phase. We'll begin in March of next year a one-year task force on a strategic U.S. approach to global health, March 09 through March of 2010. We'll recruit onto that task force 15 to 20 diverse, prominent individuals. We'll be holding public fora around the United States in areas which have emerged as centers of excellence on global health. They will include Atlanta, the Research Triangle in North Carolina, Nashville, Seattle, and San Francisco, among others. We'll attempt to tie the task force's work closely to incoming policymakers in Congress and in the administration. We will begin at the end of this year to begin posting the analyses that we've commissioned, we've begun commissioning around the building blocks, the key dimensions of, of what we will bring forward to the task force in terms of analytics, the key dimensions of global health. So keep, keep your eyes open for those pieces that we'll begin to post as we get to the end of the year. We're going to initiate a high-level speaker series that will be a regular feature here at CSIS, which we hope will stir a new discourse here in Washington around some of the most difficult and challenging aspects of bringing about a long-term strategic approach. We'll have a very activist advisory board. We have several members of that advisory board here tonight participating in the roundtable. We're going to be ask, asking them to critique us, to keep us honest, to have, have an active role in writing and speaking. We'll be carrying forward the CSIS Task Force on HIV AIDS, which is now in its at the end of its seventh year through an active working group with a very special focus on gender and HIV prevention. We'll be expanding the excellent work that's been carried forward over the last several years by Janet Fleischman with the generous support of the Packard Foundation focused on the integration of family planning and reproductive health within the broader global health programs. We'll begin a big push this year for a transatlantic dialogue with European partners around health linked with European foreign policy institutes Chatham House, CIPRI, and others. We'll continue our strong China, Russia, India, and Africa network activities and begin work in the Middle East in America's program. We've now been joined by a new dire deputy director of the America's program, Catherine Bliss, who brings special expertise on public health in the Americas. We'll be carrying forward the work of the task force on global food crisis, which we began this summer under the chairmanships of Senators Lugar and Casey. We'll be carrying that work forward, um, and we will begin active partnerships with the Africa Command and the U.S. Southern Command. 
And lastly, beginning next summer, we'll begin launching missions to low access problematic states where private health diplomacy by non governmental groups can test whether there are openings. Let me just close with a few thoughts on how we should go about our business in this next phase to get the best results. And then I'd like to turn things over to Senator Frist and the other board members who are here, as well as a close friend, Deborah Work Zoidi from the World Bank, who has kindly agreed to join us here this evening on this roundtable as well. I think there are two things we need to keep in mind as we move forward. One is that we build systematically upon our surprising shared successes of this last decade. And secondly, that we be very realistic and we keep our eyes wide open in this uncertain and very turbulent transitional period without forfeiting the optimism that we've acquired in these last few years. We have much to be proud of. Global health has emerged as a lead priority, much to many of our surprise in this last period. In the past eight years, global health suddenly emerged to our surprise as a zone of bipartisan cooperation, strong congressional executive collaboration, and predominantly through PEPFAR, it raced forward as a lead driver of U.S. foreign assistance, forged new models for the delivery of foreign assistance, now hailed as innovative, smart, and leveraging existing agencies, and successful at demonstrating concrete results. The recent $48 billion PEPFAR reauthorization, signed July 30th by President Bush, marked an historic reaffirmation of the strength of our spirit and of the bipartisan effort that has been underway and the fragile coalition that has carried things forward. Global health has certainly begun to enter the mainstream of foreign policy and national security doctrine, and we should build on that. Second, our independent policy community is at a place that we would not have foreseen in terms of the commitments on public health and global health. If we look at the Center for Global Development, the Global Health Council, Council on Foreign Relations, American Enterprise Institute, Brookings, the Institute of Medicine, George Washington University, Johns Hopkins University are all active and deeply engaged in ways that are profoundly beyond where we were 10 years ago on many of these issues. We're also a much richer society across America with much deeper roots in global health. There's been a, uh, a rapid proliferation of global health programs at American universities, upwards of 50 or more today, as against around 10, 10 years ago. And this is reflective of a profound generational shift in our own society among youth. Corporate engagement has taken serious turns towards new initiatives. Powerful foundations have made dramatic commitments. We've heard about the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the, the Rockefeller, Packard, Kaiser, and others. Religious groups are deeply engaged and NGOs are carrying forward programs far more extensive than anything that we had imagined earlier on global health. On a more cautionary note, I think our success will also rely on how ready we are to be realistic, vigilant of the quickly shifting circumstances we face, and take act active steps to mitigate the rising tensions and criticisms of some of our policy approaches. We are in an economic crisis. We know that from the dramatic events of today. We knew before that hit that debt and deficit numbers were approaching harrowing levels. It's not clear what the implications will be for foreign aid of the massive bailout package under debate. We're in an unprecedented, historic, and highly uncertain phase. Our arguments and our strategies for preserving progress will have to take full account of these new realities and be very innovative. American opinion remains promising but uncertain. Climate uh, data that we've seen shows a broad popular receptivity to U.S. commitments on global health, but that support is shallow and provisional and tinged with skepticism regarding the true values of the investments and often shallow actual knowledge of the scope and scale of investments. We have to do far more in communicating the story and far more in engaging the American public, which is what one of our aims is. We need to improve our own metrics in knowing what is working what is achieving, how are we impacting policy making. There are many conflicts, tensions, and criticisms, and we'll hear more about that in the roundtable discussion that Senator Frist will guide. We know there are rising tensions between global health and traditional development communities. There are inter deep internal divisions within the global health community over priorities uh, and, and strategies. 
Our own culture wars have gotten in the way of building a solid centrist consensus on strengthening family planning and reproductive health and tying them more systematically to broad U.S. global strategies. And we know that when we look at the bewildering array of initiatives, institutions, and partnerships around the world, how confusing and difficult it can be to find a way forward to make this more coherent and more, um, and more accountable. Thank you again, all of you here in this room. We draw our strength and our energy from many of you here. We're profoundly grateful to everything that you have brought to us. I'd like to now ask Senator Frist to come forward and introduce our panel. Thank you very much. Steve, thank you. And on the screen here, I can turn that off unless somebody's going to use that, but I don't know how to turn it off. You can tell me. Let me uh, welcome everybody. Uh, we're giving birth today to a, a, a tremendously exciting um, endeavor that we really don't know what the outcome will be. The mission has been set out, and our topic today is going to center on this overall strategy in a world that has changed so radically, as, as Steve has, has spelled out, as we look at some big issues and some big challenges. Let me ask our panelists to come on up. Again, we're going to have a free-flowing discussion. Go ahead and come up and go ahead and take three chairs. Leave one for me. I think we'll, we'll be all right there. Let me uh, tell you what we're going to do. We have about an hour, and in that hour, I'd like to, to arbitrarily take four topics, the four topics that I've not really discussed with our panelists, to do our best to keep our discussion a bit focused, although I want to keep it as freewheeling as we, we possibly can and interactive. And I, Steve, remind me if I don't do it, that about 15 or 20 minutes before we need to end, about 45 minutes from now, let's go to the floor. So think of questions you might ask our distinguished panelists uh, today. I think an operating premise should be over the next uh, hour or so that any strategic approach to tackle the challenges that are out there before us, challenges that we'll talk about, if it's to be sustainable, it's got to be comprehensive, it's got to be more balanced, it's got to be pulling people together based on a body of information, much of which has emerged over the last five years or the last ten years. One of the exciting things that we have before us is that we have tools today, in part because of initiatives in, in global health, in public health, even in acute medicine, that begin to interact with the development community with what historically has been charity, with historically it's been investment, Historically, it has been a, a, a reaching out, but at this standpoint, we need to give that, that definition. The challenges before us introduce a lot of obstacles, obstacles that, although I don't want to spend too much time on it, spell, was spelled out today in terms of, of the financial markets and the uncertainty of those markets. I do want to touch upon that. There are basically four areas that I'm going to keep bringing people back to, and again, I've not talked to our, our panel uh, about those four areas specifically. But one of those is bridging the international and the domestic divide. It's something we all have to face. When I was in the United States Senate, I'd go back to Tennessee, and people would say, what's, what's in it for me? And I could point to what happens in the Appalachian Mountains, not very different than what I see in southern Sudan or in the Congo or, or in, in Mozambique. So bridging this domestic international divide. Secondly, resolving tensions that we feel today, especially today, as we look ahead to new administrations, to elections, tensions that inevitably arise but are not discussed with a real look to the future, tensions between the, the development community versus global health. And the fact that I even use that word versus is something I want to come, come back to. Thirdly, and this was mentioned uh, earlier uh, by, by, by Steve and, and, and Sally, this whole realm of reproductive health and family planning, here in Washington, every time that, that subject is touched, people begin to back away or, or, or become entrenched or become defensive. And we need to have an environment where it's, where it's discussed head on. So I'd like to touch upon that as a third area. And the fourth area is making this overall business case for global health. And in part, public health, but beyond that, global health. Is there a business case that can be made with what we know today? Ten years ago, it was hard to do. But I think part of what our task force that Steve outlined will need to do that we should at least talk a little bit about today is that, that, that business case for global health, which ultimately translates into sustainability. 
Um, with that, I'd, I want to turn to a, a real leader uh, in the field, the field uh, that we are here in many parts to celebrate by giving birth to, to this new entity today. But I want to turn to who John Hamry referred to right at the beginning of, of his um, uh, recognition, and that is Ed Scott. Ed is co-founder and chairman of the board of the Center for Global Development. He is a successful, experienced a business a person, a former assistant secretary in the United States government, an active supporter of multiple philanthropic initiatives. He and I were talking before. The number of cross-currents and intersections and nexi that I see as I work in the field of development and foreign aid and HIV AIDS and using medicine as a currency for peace. Ed is at the center of all of that. Ed, would you mind uh, coming forward and setting sort of the big picture, framing the sort of issues that we have as challenges out there? Join me in welcoming Ed Scott. Ed, come forward. <laughs> I'm overwhelmed with those remarks. I don't ever hear people talk about me that way, so I'm very embarrassed. But um, uh, John Hamry said that I characterize myself as not an expert, and you'll be convinced of that when I sit down, <laughs> that I'm indeed not an expert. But I'm, I'm really, I think, as the Senator said, maybe a serial founder of NGOs. So, <laughs> and in that process, few things have rubbed off on me, a few ideas have rubbed off on me, and I'll take two minutes and share some of them with you and then let the real experts tell you what's really going on. Um, as we contemplate what this new Center for Global Public Health Policy ought to do and think about, uh, I would say that what we ought to think about are the big fixes. You know, there's thousands of public health experts who know how to treat diseases, know how to deploy um, uh, systems, know how to create clinics, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And if we had enough money and enough time, we could just let all that just take its normal course. Uh, I don't think we do. I think that, you know, Bono's talked about the AIDS pandemic as sort of a forest fire. And, uh, y you know, the, the major disease emergencies that are out there in the less developed world uh, truly overwhelm the health systems of those countries so that they can't practice public health in the way we practice it in the developed world because their, their, their systems are just overwhelmed by uh, AIDS, TB, and malaria. Um, there are three big fixes I think have happened in the last 10 years and they've been very, very dramatic. Two of them are institutional and one of them was sort of political. Uh, one major institutional big fix, which has been, a, I think, an incredible success, is the G8 deciding it would create the Global Fund to fight AIDS, TB, and malaria. Uh, a second was uh, the President of the United States deciding that he would make a big bet that the U.S. could contribute and change the landscape when he created PEPFAR. And the third was uh, Bill Clinton getting the drug companies together and knocking their heads together and taking the price of ARVs from, at that time, a couple thousand dollars per person per year for a treatment regimen to less than $150 a year. Without that, I can remember people, you would go talk to people in Africa about the issue and they would just say, what can we do? I mean, you know, we can give people palliative care, but if they get the infection, they're going to die. Well, it's no longer true, and it's not true because Bill Clinton changed the equation. George Bush threw a, a lot of money in the pie, pot, in the, in, in, into the pot, and um, the G8 founded the, the Global Fund. Those were all out-of-the-box big fixes. And I think we ought to be thinking about, in, in the work of this center, what are the next out-of-the-box big fixes that would change the landscape? Um, I think the structure of the global health system uh, could use another look. You know, we have, when you think about it, you have WHO, the Global Fund, the bilaterals such as PEPFAR, the NGOs, the faith-based organizations, and the ministries of health all sort of engaged in some amorphous way uh, without any system for um, how they really work together and how they intersect or how they're financed. 
And uh, it seems to me that maybe health ought to be taken out of, at least in the, in the developing world, taken out of the national arena and some kind of new scheme where everybody participates in a, in a global system. Because the diseases haven't heard about the boundaries of Zambia or China or Thailand. The diseases just go where they go. And the people get on the airplane with their infection and take it wherever they go. So it seems to me that we ought to be thinking about what is some way we could reconstitute the, the structure. Uh, secondly, there's the financing issue. Um, the fact is that we've now made a commitment to um, treat literally thousands and thousands and thousands, millions of people with ARVs, and they're going to have to get those for the rest of their life. We've also made a massive investment in malaria control, which is, which you know, and you take the island of Zanzibar where uh, malaria has been eradicated for the third time. Why is it the third time? Well, it's because the first two times it wasn't sustained, and it's going to cost money and systems to sustain that. And uh, the global funds piece of the U.S. budget is now just about to go over the billion dollar ranges. As you know, I said earlier in an earlier meeting, Senator Dirksen used to say, that's real money. And, um, and given the economic environment of the United States, i.e. today's events, think about how the Congress and the American people are going to think about financing the rest of the world's um, public health issues, especially the, sustain the sustaining demands for ARVs and malaria control, it's going to be a real, real problem. And one of the things the public health community has done a miserable job in with respect to at least AIDS, in my opinion, is the prevention dimension. Uh, you know, people are still out there getting infected and reinfecting other people because we haven't quite figured out how to get that under control. You know, we finally got our heads out of, you know, our ears and took testing out of the voluntary realm and got into this, you know, this very fancy word provider uh, initiated testing, which really means sort of pseudo mandatory testing. And, uh, but, but the truth is that the prevention dimension is still not nailed and it's even not nailed to a very significant degree in the malaria realm. And so I, I think that it would be a really good thing if, as this center goes forward, that it kind of casts its look on the world in terms of what are the big fixes like the Global Fund, like PEPFAR, like getting the cost of ARVs down that could change the landscape as we go forward and really make an important, significant, and lasting difference. Thank you very much. Ed, thank you. Ed, thank you. And I, I think just listening to Ed as he reviewed what has occurred over the last really seven years, it was 2001 that I guess we had at CSIS gave birth to the, the task force, which uh, has had a, a, a very significant impact in large part because of its flexibility and responding to, to, to changes. And, and, and turns, and that's what we can, can see. The challenges are out there, and I think Ed, Ed laid them out. Let me very quickly introduce our panel, and then we'll jump right in. Uh, Sally Canfield has, has been introduced already, obviously. She is the officer at Gates uh, Foundation responsible for government relations in this whole global health uh, uh, division. Uh, she has been deputy chief of staff in the Department of Homeland Security, Counselor to the Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services, Health Policy Advisor to the Speaker of the House. Sally, thank you for being um, with us. To uh, her left and to my right, uh, Jeff Sturcio, everybody in the room knows, is Vice President of Corporate Responsibility at Merck and Company. Uh, he has been intimately involved in managing a portfolio of activities, including Merck's corporate responsibility, philanthropy, science education, the Merck uh, Childhood Asthma Network, Global Health Partnerships, Global HIV, AIDS Access Program, and the list goes on. He serves as president of the Merck uh, Company Foundation as well, is a member of the African Comprehensive HIV AIDS Partnership in Botswana. Again, tremendous experience uh, on the advisory board as we, as we look forward. To my uh, left, um, Debra Work Zidi is, is somebody who is currently 
uh, on leave, I'll, I'll add that, from the World Bank, but does serve as the director of the World Bank's global HIV AIDS uh, program, where she has that opportunity and responsibility to provide overall strategic and technical leadership to the bank's AIDS uh, efforts. Has served in many capacities uh, before at the World Bank, was deputy director of the Africa program for the AIDS control and prevention project of Family Health International, and uh, Dita Work, thank you very, very much for, for being with us. And uh, we have uh, Robert um, Millett, who again who has been a active uh, participant in the community of global health in many ways, currently Senior Vice President, Worldwide Alliance Development, Philanthropy and Corporate Responsibility, and President of the Pfizer Foundation. He has direct supervision of Pfizer's worldwide groups encompassing philanthropy and corporate giving, alliance development, corporate responsibility, international affairs, and multilateral institutions. Uh, prior to joining Pfizer, he served as Deputy Secretary of the U.S. Department uh, of Commerce. Again, a tremendous uh, panel. Again, be thinking of questions you might ask. And let me just jump right in. I took four areas that I'd like to keep coming back to. One, bridging this domestic and international affairs. Number two, looking at these tensions between the global health community and, and the development community restoring a, a dialogue three on the issues around family planning and reproductive health and making this business case for, for global uh, health. I guess let me start, start right in on bridging the domestic and international uh, divide. And Sally, it, it's pretty clear that, that global health is often seen as sort of something over there and not right here. The political figures have a real challenge there uh, as well, because they're looking at the next campaign, the next election, you know, why is it an important issue? Why does Bill Frist spend time in Africa on development issues? You've been in the middle of, of public policy. You've been in the middle of, of an administration, uh, now working with the private foundation community. How is it best we begin to answer that question? Well, I think what we have to do first is sort of just disregard, I think, the silos that I think Washington and I think the political community tries to put around the two health issues. Because once we alleviate, I think, those silos, then you start to recognize that research and development that we're doing at NIH or at other places around the country at private, in private and public locations, research on HIV and AIDS is research on HIV and AIDS. And we hope that, you know, the application is going to be, the application is both domestic and international. Research that we do on um, investments in health systems. I mean, health systems, as you said, are going to be good for Appalachia. They're going to be good for those in Sudan. So I think to the extent that we can just eliminate those barriers and start to think from a broader perspective of how are these investments going to help the broader health community. At the foundation, something that Bill Gates is very interested in is the R&D aspect and how do we get to that next generation vaccine? How do we get to that next thing that's going to help us eliminate these diseases? And it's not just eliminate them in Africa or in India or in China, but it's, el it's eliminate them everywhere. So to the extent that we can be working together, I think that that's really an area where we can start to point out to constituents or, you know, politicians can point out to constituents. We can point out to our partners that there really doesn't have to be this divide. Obviously, we have challenges here in the United States with respect to the number of uninsured, but I think that those are, d those are different issues than we're talking about disease areas that really require, I think, that kind of focus that this organization can provide. I think the other area that we can also put a new look on is the implication for foreign policy, and that's why we were so interested in this um, institution and, and funding the policy center, is really looking at how we can look at global health in a different way, looking at it through the military lens, looking at it through the intelligence community lens, looking at it through the defense lens. How can we bring all of those pieces together? So it's almost eliminating those barriers and seeing where I think we can start to talk about a new dialogue in this area. I think you bring up a great point. And again, to sort of give definition to, to public health, there was a recent article in Lancet that, that really looked at the principles that we have to focus on, which are our foreign policy, which we began with, security, which again CSIS is uniquely focused on, Charity, and what is charity exactly? Traditionally, people look at charity, most recently HIV, AIDS, malaria, tuberculosis. Fourthly, in, in investment. And then, oh, classical public health, those five dimensions. Again, we need to shape things, which you touched, uh, I think, upon on three. If we look, 
Deborah worked at the at this whole international and domestic. The World Bank has been right right in the middle of, of activities, and you've been at the World Bank so long. Again, currently on leave, uh, I want I want to say so you can be have gives us a, a a realistic approach as we look at where we are in terms of political, our media today, our our political establishment really isn't very well informed in terms of debt. Again, I'm comparing it to your expertise at the, at the World Bank. How do you view this international? A domestic divide. Thank you, Senator Christ, and thanks to CSIS for having me here. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the person who has been at the World Bank for the last 14 years. I think it's even more useful as I look around the panel. I'm the only foreigner, and uh, I'm from Africa, a country which is a recipient of these resources. So that's, that's how I want to frame it. The question. I think, um, notwithstanding what Sally said earlier, which I agree with, the most important thing is to show results. How does the common American know that the taxpayers' money has saved lives? Um, I don't know what would have happened to the treatment agenda, frankly, if we didn't have a pet fund. So we need to do better in showing results that the money which is being invested is <coughs> saving lives. And by proxy, uh, because we are acting now, we are actually saving much more than what would have happened if we didn't act now. So these are, these are the kinds of things which we haven't done a very good job of, which we need to do. Uh, the domestic versus international. On, on that, again, from a political standpoint, because I've spent so much time around the politicians, if you went up and asked your typical political figure here in Washington, how many people were on, going back to what Steve said, we have a lot to celebrate, how many were on ARVs in 2001? And it's whatever it was, 50,000 or so in Africa. How many do we have today to celebrate that, recognizing how much more? It's 3 million, who for the most part would not be alive today. So I, I do think that's an important message that we get out, to celebrate the great progress that's been made, recognize we have a, a long way to go. And the international domestic, I didn't mean to interrupt. Everybody can interrupt, not just me. Please do. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm going to look bad. All right, keep going. Uh, it's all so learning lessons. It doesn't help to see the HIV AIDS epidemic rising in the U.S. when a whole lot of money is going to foreign countries such as uh, mine. So it is learning lessons both ways and seeing the best way of mitigating new infections. I think if we have a handle, and a lot of people alluded to it, on prevention, on preventing new infections, both domestically and internationally. That's the best way to show the results of the investment. And finally, it is about synergy. It's about consolidation. Look how long it took us before we woke up that dilapidated health systems are hindrance to treatment. We shouldn't do that. We should be synergizing. We should be looking at what are the gains of investments that are made on HIV on the broader global health issues. In fact, one of the things I like, Steve, when you say uh, the task force on HIV AIDS will continue focusing on gender and HIV prevention, that's consolidation. A tremendous amount of work has been done. How do we carry it forward when we go to the bro broader global uh, health agenda? So it is actually based on evidence showing what the money is doing mm -hmm. and how a global village, it's not about Africa. A very wise friend of mine recently said to me, is Africa only an Africa problem? So if we look at it through that lens, then we can convince people that the money they are putting on the table now to save lives in other parts of the world is something which the whole globe and the whole international community will. I think that's important. And for the task force, the, again, the HIV task force, I don't want to keep going back to that, but I think we've learned a lot and one of the great things I think that we did in terms of educating policymakers and, and opening the eyes of, of people across this country and globally was that HIV AIDS is not an Africa problem. We have the challenges here, as you pointed out, at, at that time there were more cases of HIV AIDS in India than anywhere in the world. You'd say that and people say, I can't believe that. Fastest growing was Russia, it wasn't in Africa. And I think that is a role and a responsibility that we have to open people's eyes to what Many people in the room and much of the community knows. Um, Jeff and Robert, let me turn to you. You are not, because we need to address it today, in terms of what's going on in the, in the financial markets. Let's put that aside. 
But regardless of that, we know that resources are going to be, be uh, there'll be more competition for resources, especially as we do things in this country which are going to take investments in terms of infrastructure here. In terms of this domestic international tension that is there, do either of you have, have comments? Again, I know you're not representing the corporate community, but you know lots of friends there in terms of mm -hmm. what this means for the, for the, for the future. Would you like to start, Robert? Well, I, I certainly, I think any American looking at, at what's happening today uh, is concerned about what the government's priority is going to be going forward. Everyone knows that there's a severe constraint on resources, uh, not only as a result of the um, uh, fiscal crisis that we're facing with respect to the debt crisis we're facing, but also just uh, uh, a rising debt for the country and, and budget deficits and other kinds of things. So anyone who's lived in the United States over the last uh, 10 to 12 years, you understand what that competition means. I think what leadership should do, what people who are involved in this uh, task force uh, should do, uh, is begin to put global health in the context of what it means for the United States. Uh, these are not these golden uh, uh, stovepipes anymore. Uh, President Clinton used to say, 96% of people of the world live outside the United States. We've got to go uh, to, to tap uh, global markets in his effort to uh, bring support for trade. Well, if we look at what's happening in the world, and sort of what I, in environmental health, and, and the, 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 the basic, the components of basic infrastructure, the uh, power and uh, food and water, um, uh, sanitation, uh, and uh, human resources, we see tremendous shortages and just a scourge of disease. These are festering sores. And for us to think about this in the context of being in isolation is not good for the long-term interests of the United States. It is as serious a problem for us to ignore uh, the scourge of disease and poverty and, and poor sanitation and, and poor environmental health in countries outside of the United States, in Asia, in Latin America, uh, in con uh, uh, continents like Asia, Lat uh, South America, and Africa, as it, to ignore that, we ignore vital strategic interests of the United States. So it is in our interest as a country, it seems to me, that we begin to invest in places to eliminate these, these uh, tremendous uh, burdens. And health is an unbelievable burden on development and people's potential. Now, I think that's very, very well said. It, it'll be interesting as, as new administrations come in and as Congressional has, has turnover, where the emphasis will be. I mean, you went through and we've kind of touched upon on the areas. Foreign policy in terms of, of trade and issues, the security issue, where I think CSIS has, has a, a strong, strong role to play. We haven't talked very much about poverty and development there, but you also mentioned instability, and instability where health is a basic, fundamental aspect of, of life and, and, and economy. It'll be interesting to see what that next administration does, and in part that'll be determined by where the American people are, which again comes back to this this international domestic. Uh, voice, that, that this tension that is there and how it's described and the results and be proud, proud of those. Uh, Jeff, what would you add to this? I'll move on to our second arena, but you sort of listen to everybody here. What Fill in some of the answers. Well, I'd, I'd uh, just like to build on what, what Robert was just saying about this, uh, the need to persuade people in the United States that issues of global health really are of significant uh, importance to us. And I'd like to put this in the broadest uh, context of, of foreign policy. I, there was a period after the end of the Cold War when you read about and heard about, um, uh, and probably uh, particularly here at CSIS, you probably discussed this a lot, there was a fleeting moment when people were thinking about a unipolar world in which the United States uh, you know, was, uh, after the Soviet Union disappeared and as China and India didn't seem to have the kind of power that uh, they've later come to have, uh, that there was a feeling in some circles that the United States really was um, uh, the main superpower in the world and that we would be able to command respect and to command uh, uh, other, uh, other nations to work with us on things that we thought were important. Well, I think uh, no matter what you think of the financial uh, uh, crisis of the last couple of weeks uh, and how it came about and, and what the solution is, I think it's clear from the fact that it's had global implications 
uh, that we aren't in a unipolar world and that the United States doesn't have uh, the commanding power uh, that we once thought we did. Uh, and as we begin to look at the issues that will have an impact on us in the future, um, I think, uh, as Robert and others have pointed out, global health uh, issues are going to be significant ones. Uh, because, uh, you know, in a, in a world in which um, viruses can travel from Boston to Bujumbura almost as fast as, uh, you know, as a plane can get you uh, to Central Africa, um, we can no longer look at these issues in isolation. Uh, and also, on the other side, as, uh, as we've alluded to, um, by the good that the U.S. does through programs like PEPFAR and the other global health investments we have, um, people in Africa and Latin America and Asia really do um, feel that uh, the United States is an important partner in helping them to deal with these, these challenges. I think in the long run, uh, it's, it's going to be important for us uh, to, uh, to really think about the way in which uh, collaboration and uh, uh, and coordination are going to be helpful to the U.S. as well as to our partners in addressing these issues because the global health issues that we face are so complicated uh, that no single nation, no single institution certainly uh, can deal with them. Uh, and I'm reminded of work that Amartya Sen uh, uh, did some years ago when he looked at famine and the problem of famine uh, and often one found that people were starving even though there was food nearby. Uh, and it really became a question not of the lack of food or the lack of global health resources in, in this analogy, but it was because they were maldistributed. And so the question, and it's not a simple question, of how to improve the allocation of those resources to deal with these global health challenges is something that's going to affect all of us. And it's, uh, as, uh, as uh, Robert and Senator Frist were saying, uh, this is something that is of strategic significance for the United States in the, in the coming years. I think it's important also, I mean, for the, for the political folks, I mean, this next new administration, whoever's coming in and a new Congress, I think it's going to behoove all of us in the global health community to give them a reason to say yes. And I think to think about how we frame the issues, we talked about talking about success. It's we've, you know, we've done so much, but there's so much more to be done. And I think it's going to be much easier in this environment with, I think, budget challenges and all the rest to say, no, it's not available. And I think what we need to do, and it behooves this community, is really to coordinate among ourselves and start talking about how we can get them to say yes. What are the reasons why we, we want them to continue this funding? And I think it sort of goes to what we've all been saying is there's a broader um, set of policy reasons for doing global health beyond what I think we've just, we've really been talking about for the last several years. Second issue that and again, we can come back, and, and when we come to the floor, we can come back to any of these issues. The second issue that I want to throw out, and again, these are sort of unrehearsed, but is the tension, and this is, again, real tension that um, is felt now in Washington, and I think in, in sort of committees of, of policy and, and governance, and that's the tension between global health and development. I, I sit on the board of the Millennium Challenge Corporation, which is, a, a, I think, a wonderful program that looks at at, at development, sustainable economic development, um, long term, and looking at governance. If, if, if you're going to try to have sustainable economic development in a corrupt government, it's probably just not going to work. And we begin to look at that for the first time. And then we have our traditional global health community, of which I've, I've sort of uh, emerged from uh, as well. And you can kind of feel the, the tension that is there today. With Deborah work, we've got the, the, uh, the, the expert, really, in, in both of those fields here. So I won't put you on the spot at first. I'll, I'll turn to, to people on either side of both of us. But the question that I'll, I'll put out is this. There's a, a rising sense that basic developmental requirements in poorest communities have been neglected as global health commitments have expanded. Two broad camps are emerging, a global health community and a group calling for macro foreign aid reform. How is a, a greater common purpose to be created? So I'll let you guys and gals jump in. Well, let's we'll that, start right here. That's a fairly simple question to answer. Oh, good. <laughs> good. So, I hope everybody agrees with you here. We'll see. <laughs> well, I, I'd just uh, like to make one observation. I mean, it's, uh, and I'm sure it's, it's one that's occurred to many here. Uh, but because of the links between health and wealth, um, you really shouldn't look at this as an opposition or a dichotomy. It's a false dichotomy uh, because investments in health really help with development just as investments in de development help with health. Uh, let me just give you one quick example. I, 
Merck's been involved for over 20 years in, in a program called the Mectazan Donation Program, in which we've uh, given away a medicine, Mectazan, which helps to treat river blindness. And river blindness is a disease that affects about uh, 120 million people in some of the poorest countries in the world, mainly in Africa. And the, uh, I won't uh, go into all the details, but one of the things that I want to just focus on is that the way that this uh, program has been developed in cooperation with the bank and with uh, WHO and the African Program on Onchocerciasis Control and many other partners, including NGOs on the ground and the national health ministries in the countries affected. Um, but the way that it's been uh, delivered, the medicine has been delivered, has been by training more than uh, almost half a million community health workers in more than 100,000 communities. Uh, and so you might say that here's an example of where an investment in global health has, uh, has sort of skewed the uh, em emphasis on what available funds are and where people should go, and it's, it's uh, led away from development. But by having these hundreds of thousands of community health workers providing an annual treatment of Mectazan, um, they've also been able to use that network of health workers in these communities throughout Africa uh, to help with uh, testing people for signs of trachoma, to implement vitamin A enrichment programs, to help with immunization programs, and uh, the list goes on and on. And so basically what this investment has done and this partnership has, has done is really helped to build primary health care at the community level in, in these countries. And that's had a tremendous impact on, on economic development in that part of the world uh, because people, uh, if they're healthier, they can be more productive. And that really has been demonstrated in, in part by studies that the World Bank has, has conducted. So that's uh, one example of how health and development really are integrally related. Uh, and one can't really separate the, the two. And I think, it's a, I think it, it's a good example. First of all, the 120 million people, how many have you been able to, to reach? Well, that, that's, that's the number of people who are actually at risk. Right. Um, we now reach about 100 million people a year um, with these, uh, these treatments uh, through this, uh, this network of partners. Uh, and also, um, together with GlaxoSmithKline and others in the Global Alliance to Eliminate Lymphatic Filariasis, uh, we're also uh, able to reach people uh, to prevent lymphatic filariasis or elephantiasis as well. So, so two things. The, and this applies, I think, to bed nets, to ARVs across, across the board. By coming in with a very sharp focus, at least initially, it does propel more horizontally the system to develop. Mm -hmm. Yet I think we're going to find through our, our task force that the system's development has been an ignored area in terms of both development mm -hmm. in health as well as what our government has done directly. And that's, again, sort of a stage which I think we can have all sorts of, of opportunities uh, in the future. I, I guess I, I, to, 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 I, I want to give a very direct answer to your question about the tension between uh, development needs yeah. and global health. I actually believe uh, there has been a tremendous disparity in our investment in health versus our investment in some other things but not because uh, people might not be willing to make other kinds of investments. I think people fund what they see and experience. And we saw AIDS. We see and understand tuberculosis. Uh, we've been hearing about malaria. But when we say, well, you know, the power grid in a lot of these countries simply don't work so well, people say, well, what, what does that mean? I use an example, my, my mother, uh, my family lives in Houston, and they were affected by the hurricane uh, um, Ike. And my mother's power has been off for about two weeks. She got it two days ago, and she called me <laughs> very ecstatic about it. Yeah, and I said, yeah. you know, just think about there are people in certain parts of the world where that is how they live. She did not want to hear that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, but that experience, you know, sort of just talking to her about it, she said, well, I don't know how they make it, was her response, yeah, yeah. because she was so burdened by that. Now, mm -hmm. I think if we dramatize how people live, power grids are poor, uh, they, are, they can't grow adequate food to feed their populations, their water systems right. are, are essentially uh, non-existent, uh, sanitation, just building latrines will, will really help. And think about the dearth of human resources, investment in human resources. These are all big issues. And I think helping people understand that and balancing our investment in global health with more investment in these things, I think, will carry us a mighty long ways to a, a much improved world. But I don't 
fault of what we've done. We needed to invest in global health. That's no fault of anybody uh, at all. Deborah Works Zudi at the bank, I mean, uh, 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 Ed talked about President Clinton's role in bringing the prices of drugs down, and that was a, a very constructive role he played. But one of the biggest things we did was the World Bank stopped loaning people money for AIDS and start giving grants. So that, that was, she won't say it, and I'll say it for her, that was her brainchild, and that completely changed the way we dealt in global health. But we are still loaning money for power. We're still loaning money for these other, other things. I think it takes a new kind of creativity in what we ought to be doing. And this, this connecting the dots um, is absolutely critical. I mentioned earlier that the media is pretty thin on, on the understanding. It's not, it doesn't provide teachable moments like you had with, with your mom, te it, learning it both ways. Go, it did go over well. No, I know. <laughs> you, you capitalize on these teaching moments with drama. And, and for us to get that voice out, to really have this more complete uh, linkage, I think is a huge responsibility and a huge opportunity for us, given the fact that we have successes like the ones you've just, just uh, heard about today. Now, I know you're not speaking for the World Bank. You're on leave. So speak, speak, speak your heart. No, I know. So put it all, put it all together on, this, on, on, on whether it's the infrastructure or development. When we say development, we're thinking more infrastructure or on the global health community. I'll do even better. I represent real people. Good. The ones who don't have power all the time. But a couple of things. If there is anything good about HIV AIDS, it is the fact that it brought out the way we have been doing development and its inadequacies. Right, right. I think that's, that's uh, one thing. Uh, the dichotomy doesn't help because we need both. And one is not, we can't do one without, without the other. The issue for me is, and here is an agenda for uh, CSIS, for, for the new Global Health Center. The empirical evidence whether this is true is very clear. Either we haven't done it, or it doesn't exist. So that's that's one. Say agenda. that again. Say it again. The empirical uh, empirical evidence, evidence for that investing in health or in HIV AIDS has uh, diverted or taken resources from other development issues. Right. The so idea that there's a fixed amount of money out there and money that goes into the HIV AIDS, malaria, tuberculosis has in some way diminished investment. Yeah. Yeah. But there are lessons. The lessons are the following. Unlike broader aid on HIV AIDS, you have to show results before you get the next resources. It's the same for PEPFA, it's the same for the Global Fund, it's the same for the World Bank. So that is something, that's a good lesson to be taken. How much do you get for your investment in whatever you invested it on? And do we have enough information out there now to spell that out? On HIV AIDS, yeah. we do. On malaria, we do. On malaria and TB. TB, we do. Yes. Clean water. No. no, no, no. Sanitation. Same thing. This is right. this is the lesson. With that if we could do it for HIV AIDS, why can't we Good. do it for clean water? The last point is sustainability. Had we done well in development aid, maybe some of our problems that we are facing now in global health would have been very different from what we see now. And that is building the local capacity, sustainable capacity, to fight not only the current epidemic, but the epidemics that can come in the future as well. One of my favorite stories uh, is, is Pfizer participates in an effort around trachoma because we have a drug that, that's uh, tailor-made to help that disease. But we are in partnership with many different uh, organizations. The Carter Center is one of them. And the Carter Center came to brief us on their work in trachoma. We work with a small organization called the International Trachoma Initiative. But Carter Center is a major partner, and they were doing work in Ethiopia, in the Amharic region of Ethiopia. And they were investing, the, the, the trachoma alleviation requires a five-pronged strategy. One of those uh, is uh, environmental change. And one of the things that they, they wanted to do was build latrines, and they were giving each district uh, goals for building these latrines. And the, a district had a goal of building 10,000 latrines within a year. Well, they set about to build the latrines. We went back in a year, Carter Center went back after a year, and discovered they had not built 10,000 latrines, they had built 300,000 latrines. Mm -hmm. This low-tech uh, development issue. And someone said, well, what happened? The government wanted to know what happened. Uh, Pfizer wanted to know what happened. The Carter Center wanted to know what happened. So they set about to begin to interview people in the region. Well, it turns out that 
through religious custom, many women were unable to relieve themselves during daylight hours. With the building of a latrine, they could go and relieve themselves during daylight in private. So they took over the building of the latrines <laughs> because it completely changed their lives. Well, now that, to me, is an investment in development, and it didn't cost us very much. But things, and help people, and those, they helped us come up with that solution. They showed us that, you know what, this is what we want and need. We thought we knew. They said, this is what we want and need, and we can do it ourselves. Just give us a little encouragement and help. I think there are models like that all over in development that we could be duplicating. And I've asked the Carter Center to write that up in the yeah. study just so that there's more data around it and more knowledge. That's replicable all over Asia and Africa and other parts of the world. And it, it means that, that we, and we, I don't know if it means America or society or civil society, need to get over a little bit of the arrogance that we know what's best and have enough flexibility. And we, I'll put on my political hat, means you have to get out of earmarks. You have to, you have to get out of, of so constraining people's hands. But we can only do that, I think, if we know that money is going to have be used wisely. Or to go back to my taxpayers in Saudi days of Tennessee, i got to be able to say, this money is being used wisely. These are results in the past. So trust the system enough that we can give the flexibility to have indigenous peoples coming up with, with the solutions. Let, let me move um, uh, quickly, because I, I feel like time is going by, and I do want to get to, to the audience. Uh, to this whole issue, the third issue I brought up, of restoring a dialogue and commitment to, to issues surrounding family planning and, and reproductive health. I put that right on the table because it was just three months ago with the PEPFAR reauthorization that, again, it, it sort of grabbed the system that ultimately ends up in policy and legislation. And in some way, and I'd look, love to hear from, from, from our panel in terms of ideas of how we can break through that, how we can bring people together, have intelligent, mature discussions, even if people don't agree. Any thoughts on that, that issue? I think it's actually a willingness to actually come to the table. I think at the Gates Foundation, we've been trying to host a series of dialogues among the entire community. And it's, it's a challenge. I think it's something that we are continuing to push, though. And I think it's, you have to start and sit down. What are the things that you agree on? Uh, women shouldn't die in childbirth. Women should have choices. And so I think to the extent that we can all sort of come and talk about common language, that's an important place to start. It's very simple, but it's very important. Um, and you're right. There may be places where we are never going to agree. You will never get both sides. But I think in this sort of never, the both sides never sitting down and never understanding where there is common, where there is common ground, we've really missed an opportunity, I think, in this area to move that agenda forward. So to the extent that organizing um, places like the foundation, like CSIS, can host a, a series of, of meetings. And it really has to start, start from a very basic understanding of what are the things that we can agree on and using plain language in and of itself. And, and that, I think, I mean, it's, it's got, it, it really is a challenge, but we, we can no longer ignore, I think, the issue and the dialogue that has to happen. Other thoughts? What? Others will have other thoughts. I, at the risk of, of sounding a political statement, and I don't mean it to be, but what this teaches us is that issues around development and global health, they can't be captive of any ideology. They, they simply can't be. We, 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 it's, not, it's not that we can't have a morality uh, in what we do, but we, we, we've got to understand what works and, and do what works for people. So we can't hold these things hostage either to domestic politics in the United States or to some international set of norms. We've got to see what works on the ground with people. And there's a danger in allowing ourselves uh, to get into the rut of allowing our policies to be driven by a particular ideology. And I say this as a person of faith. No, and I think, I think, I think that's right. I think, going back to Sally's comment, in terms of looking ahead, I'm not going to solve it now, is that it needs to be put out front, whether it's a maternal and child health mm -hmm. issue or, or a 1.2 billion people clean water and who gets the water, or whether it's, it's uh, uh, the whole range of issues. I do think we have a common enough experience now that with the right forum that we can put it out and, and address it head on and the intersection mm -hmm. of issues. I would just yeah. add, uh, as we were saying a few moments ago, that it's important in looking for solutions that work 
uh, to you said to have the flexibility, and Robert and Deborah work also uh, spoke to this, to actually listen to the people we're trying to help and ask them what they think is the most important solution and how we can work toward finding a common solution. I, I think that's one of the issues that um, is certainly with reproductive uh, health and family planning, um, we've seen relatively little of that kind of openness to, yeah. to dialogue with, uh, with the folks we're trying to help. Let me turn. I, yeah, please. I, I think family planning and reproductive health is fundamental to development. Uh, I remember when I was an elementary school student in Ethiopia, I remember distinctly writing the population of Ethiopia is 22 million. The population of Ethiopia now is over 80 million. But, uh, and and that you're not that old. That that is fundamental to disease prevention, to the disproportionate infection in women and young girls in most of the developing countries happen because of lack of good reproductive health, behavioral issues, the indoctrination, the inequality issues. So this is fundamental. Uh, um, again, um, as a foreigner, I should, I should limit what I say, but what but the... You don't really... Oh, well, keep going. <laughs> keep going. <laughs> What you do here resonates and dictates what other countries do in this area. So the, all the more reason why care should be involved when you deal with family planning and reproduction. And, and I do think there are success stories. Again, mm -hmm. celebrating what is good, what works, what is right. I was in Bangladesh last year, and it's a, it's a classic country where there were, there were seven, seven and a half children to a family 20 years ago. And now, for all sorts of reasons, but for reasons, it's now down to about three and a half, the most populated country, uh, one of the most populated countries uh, in the world today. And so I think there's great opportunity there, and I look forward to, to addressing those uh, issues here. Let, let me move in a little bit, I think it's really, really pertinent today, the public-private partnership end of things is, is important, but as we look at sustainability of, of of what we're talking about. It's going to require involving business community, both business community here, but also an investment overseas. Uh, both of you represent indirectly two organizations that have done mm -hmm. a tremendous job. But on sustainability, what else can, 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 should we at least be thinking? And again, I'll turn initially to, to, uh, to Jeff and, and Robert on this. Well, I think um, one of the things that struck me uh, as interesting in, a, in the Oslo Ministerial Decla Declaration uh, that came out last year, and some of you will be familiar with that, this was an effort led by the governments of France and Norway and involved uh, Thailand and South Africa and a couple of others, but they were looking at global health as a foreign policy issue. Uh, and it's a, a very interesting document. It was published in, in The Lancet um, uh, about a year, a little over a year ago. Um, and I read through the entire thing uh, and agreed with many of the issues that they raised, but they hardly mentioned the private sector at all. Mm -hmm. And I think that it comes back to this question of allocation of resources, collaboration, and, and coordination. Um, you know, the world faces, uh, we haven't even talked about um, non-communicable disease. We've been focusing on HIV, TB, and malaria. But if you look at the burden of illness over the next uh, 20 or 30 years, um, heart disease, card, um, uh, respiratory disease, diabetes, these are growing epidemics in developing countries as well. And so not only will we have to sustain the gains that have been made in dealing with infectious disease, but we're going to have to figure out a way to find the resources and the, um, the solutions to deal with non-communicable disease. So in, in this Oslo Ministerial Declaration that really sensibly says we need to look at global health as a major foreign policy issue in the, in the years ahead, um, the one thing that seemed to me to be a blind spot in it was that they're planning to come up with new solutions using the old methods of governments working together as donors and, and recipients. So I think that for sustainability, getting the private sector engaged, just as uh, ensuring that civil society is more engaged in finding solutions and implementing them, is going to be critical. And I think we've seen, uh, not just with Pfizer and Merck, but other uh, major multinational companies, uh, over the last several years have come to see that we have a vital interest in global health as well. Uh, because a company like ours is involved in dozens of countries around the world, um, we can't uh, ultimately uh, do well in countries that uh, are coping with these issues or not coping well with these issues. In fact, um, uh, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development um, uh, made a statement a while ago that I, uh, strikes me as uh, 
as interesting and, and uh, important. They said uh, that businesses cannot succeed in countries that fail. Uh, and I think that that really underscores the point that I was making about why it is that business has to be concerned about global health, because when we go back to the nexus between health and development, um, the countries now that um, are beginning to, uh, to develop emerging markets that will be important in the years ahead uh, will only continue on that trajectory if they're able to deal with the health issues. And so businesses do have uh, a direct interest uh, in, in that. And just as Robert said earlier that the U.S. has, uh, it's in our interests to be concerned about global health from the point of view of U.S. foreign policy, I think the same thing can be said uh, for most major businesses that are active around the world, that we also have an interest in ensuring that, uh, that health improves. And I, and I think that, that public-private, meaning government-private in this case, there's a certain assurance in terms of corruption that government can help give too, whether it's mm -hmm. standards, whether it's criteria to make sure the synergies are there. Uh, Robert, I want to turn to you. I want to get the microphone out to the audience. Uh, now, is there, is there one in, out there? Here? You have microphones back there? And then we'll take, uh, go straight to questions. Robert, well, I'm out, it, let's it, have a hand for questions. Anybody? Okay, we'll go to the back, in the very back there for the first question. Robert. Well, I'll make it very short. No, it's okay, it, go ahead. It, it would be hard to improve upon uh, what Jeff said. He's absolutely right. Business can't, we can't, we can't thrive when we want to do business in chronically sick, chronically undereducated environments. Uh, it's bad for our business. It's very difficult to grow your business. People uh, can't be productive when they're sick. So th I think the business case is fairly easily made. Uh, and I think uh, most global companies certainly are understanding it. Not only does it have a, an impact on our commercial success, it has an impact on how we internally grow, organically grow, uh, the kinds of employees we can attract, uh, people who want to work for companies that have a broader vision uh, than just what they, they market and sell. So I, I think the case is very easy for business. and. You, you have on this, this podium today, uh, certainly representatives of, of two companies uh, and someone who works for an organization that's a derivative of a wildly <laughs> successful company who understood that they right. have to, to grow beyond that existing borders. Yeah, I also think, though, it's not just resources. I mean, I think, Senator Chris, we were in Rwanda about a month ago. It's also, I think many of these countries are asking for our brain power. They Absolutely. want us to come over and help them solve <laughs> problems. And so to the extent that as companies, to develop corporate development programs or I'm going to take a sabbatical, the president of Rwanda said, you know, we really would like you to come over and help us solve this health system problem. Or can we have some of your smart people come and help us how we're going to do the disbursement of, of ARVs. So to the extent that it's not just resources that companies are providing, but it's also their brain power. And we need to, we need to make right. that easier. At the right. Global we Initiative last week, you're exactly mm -hmm. right, Rwanda, when we were there, it's very clear. At the Clinton Global Initiative last week, there is this connection of the dots, how we can make it easier for this audience or people listening to actually contribute to the managerial administrative aspect. Because mm -hmm. right now it's hard to do. Mm -hmm. Somebody out there listen to me, I want to do it, but how in the world do I do it? We need to make that easier. All right, to the audience, uh, whoever has a microphone back there. Al Milliken, uh, American Independent Writers. Uh, how important has been the role of religious and in particular Christian missionary funding and staffing been in improving uh, global health. Uh, I personally was involved earlier, earlier this year in helping a medical clinic in rural Nicaragua that previously had none. And I see that some of you have faith-based uh, ties. Uh, where do medical doctors who are also missionaries and those partnering with them fit in with the CSIS uh, Global Health Policy Center? I will open up and quickly turn to, to others, uh, for the last 10 years I've gone into Southern Sudan, not as a United States Senator, not as a majority leader, but as, as a physician. Not just Southern Sudan, but was operating in Mozambique about six weeks ago, and the Congo, and, and I've done it. And it's, that's been through mainly faith-based initiatives, um, uh, because they've been very responsive, they've been on the ground, they've got a long history, much of not just Africa, but around the world, and not just Christian faith-based uh, initiatives, but Muslim across the board, uh, are on the ground. It's intimate. It, it is there. It's trust. It's built on an understanding. So I'm a huge advocate for it. 
And in Africa, much of the infrastructure and the families built built around about faith and, and, and church. So from a practical standpoint. But I'll have others who might have experience. So. Well, I think the, the last couple trips that I've taken to Africa on the plane have been several groups of students that have been from faith-based organizations that have been going over to spend six weeks, eight weeks with uh, a mission or a church there to help you know do that kind of community work so I think not only are the that's important on the ground there I think also if you look in the political realm here um, you know Saddleback Church was able to just convene an entire uh, you know political establishment around this issue of global health and HIV AIDS so to the extent it's not just I think on the ground that the um, the, that the religious organizations are helping, but they're also helping carry the message back here in the United States, which is very important to get out that message of what we're doing and how we're being successful. Yeah, let me have a question from over here. It's right here on the second row. Any other comments on the faith-based initiatives uh, out there? Clearly an, an important role uh, in, in many regards. Working in partnership. Yes. Um, yes, hi, thank you very much. Susie Peel, and I would like to address one of the issues that Deborah Work uh, raised which is um, that bridging all of these different gaps is going to involve a lot of communication skills at the frontline level. And I would like to uh, hope that health communications will be one of the things addressed, not just policy, not just uh, development of new technologies or distribution of, of commodities, but actually communication, which is, has an education component. You mean on the ground? In, Absolutely, in know, the front lines. Comments? On that, yeah, I agree. <laughs> well, <laughs> yes, <laughs> but but I, everybody's going to agree. But we don't do a very good job. Again, it comes up to where we know best. A little bit of the arrogance coming in. That's why even when we go over as doctors or as medical students and all, in truth, it's got to be a tool to educate others to build systems with their communication tools because people are going to listen to them or people that that are on the ground. And it's a huge challenge uh, coming through. Let me go to the middle. Uh, Grab a microphone there, please. Thanks. Dr. Michael Duanis from Lighthouse International. Um, I have an observation, a question, and a challenge. Uh, the observation is that, you know, we did a really good job with our acute care model with HIV AIDS. And what we ended up doing was creating a chronic disease. And now we don't know exactly how to combat that because we have an acute care system, an acute care model doesn't work well on chronic diseases. You mentioned other things like cardiovascular disease, diabetes. These are big issues. Now, the question I have is how do we take our acute care system and change it to a prevention system? And if you want to talk about sustainability, the value in prevention is where the cost savings and the money is. So the, I guess the challenge I have here is how do we change our system? Um, and then the, the, an underlying question is for sustainability is that if we look at our spending, and let's just take the fence thing, for instance. No, let's not take the fence. Okay. <laughs> well, let me ask you a question. Could you use the CSIS to tell me as a taxpayer what percentage of that goes toward environmental and energy problems? What goes to health disparities on a global and what percentage goes to socioeconomic disparities? And then really what percentage goes to ideological differences? That would be an interesting Good, thing. good. Comments, I, I think you're right. And the percentages are obviously out there, and we can get them. And part of what CSIS will, will be doing is, is this communication, getting these real stories, what's worked, what had worked, challenges in an environment that is safe, that is real, that's got the best data, and that is something we can do. Earlier comments that, that he made? Well, I, I would just add, one. I mean, obviously you've raised a, a huge challenge, and it's something that uh, uh, if, if the CSIS Global Health Center comes up with the answers to those questions, it will have, have been an investment well, well worth it. Investment. That's right. But uh, all I want to say is Ed Scott mentioned at the beginning one of his three major big fixes or big fixes needed was prevention, and I think that, you know, you've just come back to that. We really haven't had a chance to, to talk about it much, but I think with the kinds of diseases we've been discussing and also with, um, with noncommunicable diseases, uh, you know, the best way to, uh, or the most cost-effective way to deal with an infectious disease is to prevent the infection in the first place. 
Uh, and I think that that's an insight that many people understand, but we haven't figured out a way to translate it into the way in which health systems operate here at home and abroad. So the more uh, emphasis that we can place on prevention and health promotion, the more likely it is that the resources that are available will go further. I, I agree, but when we first started doing, when I first started doing heart transplants, everybody said, first of all, it can't be done. And it can be done, and we started to do it. As soon as we did a heart transplant, got the heart in, it worked fine for about a month. And then the new challenges that came in terms of immunosuppression, how you diagnose mm -hmm. rejection, how you treat the infections, opened up the whole world. And that's kind of what we've seen now with antiretrovirals, critically important, $6,000 six years ago only to treat it, mm -hmm. now down to $100. Amazing progress. But for every person this year that we put on an antiretroviral, there are going to be four coming through the door with a new infection. But that's something we didn't really know before. And that flexibility, mm -hmm. that channeling of resources, the tension that is regard how much do you use for treatment, how much you treat, treat, treat for, or, or place for prevention is, again, I think what we're going to be in the business of helping people uh, do. What other comments on that? Two very short uh, points. Number one, uh, I don't think it's health or health systems or the health community that's going to do prevention. This is one of the unfinished agendas of HIV AIDS, mm -hmm. making it a multi-sectoral issue. It's the education sector, it's the homeland security, it's the, the, uh, the other uh, parties who would help make sure that we do prevention. Secondly, it may be cheaper, but it is harder. Treatment is more expensive, but it's you treat. So that is the dilemma that, that we're in, but it is irrespective of the fact that it is difficult, it's something that we need to embark on and find new ways and different ways of attacking it from different directions. It's a mistake to make it a health, this is where it comes to. Prevention is not only a health problem, therefore the health community only is not going to address it. It's a broader issue. And it does tie the, the acute to the chronic, to the infrastructure, to the system, to the workforce issues that, that we know we're going to have to, to come together. We've got time for, for, I think, just one more question. Mm -hmm. I started there, 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 so we're coming back over here. Um, third row. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, look, there's a microphone coming. Thank you. I hope my voice holds up. The other tension that you would have to deal with once you have the consensus and the, and, and the funding for for the projects. The, the, the other tension is the tension I see between the donors and, and the countries. The countries are insisting that you help them build, develop their health systems, human capacity. I remember when I went with the Secretary of Health to Mozambique. He says, oh, we're grateful for all you've done for us, but you know, these are good programs, but if I want to scale up these programs, I, I need human resource capacity to do that. He said, that's the major weight limiting stuff. We are able to get away with it with um, HIV and to, to some extent malaria. But if you bring two, three or more diseases again, I don't think that this silo, this silo approach could, would, would actually work. There's no room anymore for any approach that does not help develop either the system or the human capacity. And Sally, Sally touch, began to touch upon that. Other comments on this? We have, a, we have a million people, health workers every year who migrate. A million. And there's this gravitation to gra gravitating where the money is, naturally, and that's the United States, where a lot of people come into this country, and it affects our surgical training programs, our workforce here, and it also is a brain drain from other countries, and then also within countries where people gravitate to HIV, AIDS, malaria, where the money is, is flowing today. Huge issue, huge issue coming in. Um, any thoughts on that? Again, it's a huge issue out there, but one that we will be addressing as we go forward. Comment on this issue? Okay, first of all, first of all, and then on anything on this, this mm -hmm. issue of human capacity? Um, a number of things. I think earlier I said about, I talked about synergy and consolidation, not only to deal with the, the current epidemics, but what would come. I, I think this is the big lesson. The second, the human capacity, I think we need another session. It's, <laughs> it's, I, I, I beg to defer. It's not only for economic reasons that people migrate. There are a number of fundamental things which we overlook. Maybe that is why 
we are where we are now. But there are fundamental issues that are cha changing now, and issues such as task shifting, issues such as tuning, which the world, both in the north and in the south, is coming, coming together. But the whole idea is, can we use the existing investment to make sure that not only do, do we deal with today's epidemic, but what will happen in the future as well. I think it, it, it needs a mind shift as to where we go from here on and what kinds of different epidemics the world is going to face. Uh, training, and, uh, training and development is something that we're very much focused on at the foundation. And I think to the extent that we can help start to train in country and you know use the systems that they have there and develop the systems, that's such an important focus for the foundation. We are really we have an entire division focused on del health delivery, mm -hmm. and part of that is in-country training. I think that there's actually, we went and visited one um, place in Rwanda where we had funded, um, um, it was almost like school rooms, and it had, a, it had a place where people could come in a very remote part of the country to learn on how to do delivery and how to treat people. So to the extent that training in country of the people in the country is a focus of the foundation, that's, it's, a, it's a critical issue. I, I, this is where I, I think I'm a bit of a heretic because I, I agree completely uh, investment in human resources in country is very important. But here's where I think, and I've got myself in trouble on a panel I was on in the UK <laughs> once about this. This is where I think, particularly in Africa and probably in some parts of, of South Asia, uh, where countries are not showing enough creativity themselves. And I use the example that when we wanted to develop the West in the United States, we had a home setting act. We said, so you go out there and you develop this land, we're going to give you 100 acres, or whatever it was. And we had a stampede of people moving to help develop the West. We thought of the land-grant college system. I mean, you, you've got to have some, some, domes some domestic things to encourage people to want to stay home. And Deborah Work is right. Most yeah. people want to stay where they are. They want to be near their families or people they love. So mm -hmm. I think, particularly in Africa, and I think to some extent in other parts of the world, a lot of governments have simply not been creative enough in trying to define ways to maintain their, that people stay home. You can incentivize people mm -hmm. to do that. And I think much more needs to be done on that side. Secondly, there's a horde of NGOs and others. I mean, we are involved with the Infectious Diseases Institute uh, in Kampala, Uganda. Uh, Pfizer helped to build and develop it. But Uganda uh, and the regional, uh, the people in the region, they've got to invest in that institute as well so that they can develop their own infrastructure. Uh, investing in public health schools in these mm -hmm. countries, not just in medical schools, but in public health schools to learn how to run systems. I think a lot of responsibility for that has to be uh, internal. Not that we can't help, because I think we have to help, but a lot more emphasis on that. I, I don't think we disagree with that. I mean, I think that that's actually something that, you know, that goes back to, to me, to the issue of how do we, a lot of times, you know, it's how do we help them understand what the incentives are and what the incentive structure is. It's going back to, you know, they, they want our brain power as well as our resources. So to the extent that we can help them devise those incentive systems, to me, is a really, it's a key place that I'm not sure that we've really developed enough yet as private, or you know, as a private foundation or as, you know, mm -hmm. pri organizations that work with companies, to the extent that we have people that do this, how do we help them incentivize to go and, and work yeah. with those companies? Well, see, I think the African diaspora in the United States and the UK and other places, for example, there are people who want to go back home and help. I was on a panel mm -hmm. with a guy from Nigeria who was educated by the British government, went to school there, he's married there, he has his family there. He says, well, I want to know how the UK is going to send me back uh, to work in Nigeria. I said, well, now why should the taxpayers of, of right. the UK send you back to Nigeria to help the Nigerians? They educated you, they want you working here. The Nigerians ought to figure out a way to get you back mm -hmm. to Nigeria. I mean, I, I think they, they have to invest in this, and when that starts to happening, lots of things can happen. I mean, there are doctors and nurses and others who are here who would love to go back for a brief period of time if they could. And I think that has to be incentivized, I think, by countries in other shores. It, mm -hmm. it, it not only would, 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 would create a different kind of revolution, it actually would show their own population what's possible. Mm -hmm. and, and I think more of that needs to be done. You know, well, I, can I just well, add one, one point one on more, that? One more comment, then mm -hmm. we'll bring it to a close. I know we're about 15 yeah. minutes over, uh, but I think this reflects 
uh, the, the excitement and enthusiasm yeah. we have as we look at this range of issues over uh, the, the next year in the task force. I just wanted to add that the African Union uh, mission to the, uh, to the UN uh, has just created something called the African Diaspora Health Initiative, which looks to work with uh, people in the diaspora on j in just the way that, that Robert was talking about. So that's something that I think we'll want to look into and, and see if we can, uh, can collaborate with them there. And the other thing I just wanted to say was that uh, a lot of the um, work under the auspices of the Global Health Workforce Alliance has looked at some of these issues around capacity building. And there's some interesting uh, opportunities there to follow up on. So I, that's something else we'll, we'll want to keep an eye on. We uh, said we'd be a, an hour, and we're an hour and 15 minutes. Uh, I think, as, as Steve set out, um, our goal through CSIS is, is pretty clear. And it, it is a strategic. And strategic means lots of different things to, to lots of different people. But it, it covers the range of issues that we talked about to, today. That strategic vision for global health. And global health, is, as we've heard today, touches foreign policy and, and trade, it touches clean water and public, traditional pl public health. It touches humanitarian efforts and, and, and charity. It touches investment and development. And the exciting thing for me is that through the great leadership of John Hamry, through the board at CSIS, the wonderful supporters and sponsors without whose work this could not be one, of which the Gates Foundation and Kaiser and so many others uh, is, is there, leads us to this commitment starting in, in March, as Steve set out, with an initial task force. It will be a one-year task force addressing many of these uh, issues. Uh, I do want to thank everybody for, for coming today to this birthing ceremony for a really exciting venture as we go forward who I think can bring a rational approach, a common sense approach, a sophisticated approach to the issues that we've talked about uh, today. Today was a little bit of a tease. But I ask everybody to join me in thanking the panelists uh, before us today, Sally and, and Jeff and Deborah Work and Robert. Thank you for being with us, and thank all of you for coming today.